was striking in, in the beginning was that when I tried to convert this, the system X'd something out there. So the X is not part of the presentation. The X came when it X'd out the printed newspaper. <laughs> so this is no gag or anything. This is what really happened here. So sometimes I really feel maybe it would be good if it was X'd out at some stage. But then again, we know it wouldn't be good at this stage because we still need the printed paper for several reasons. But I'm mainly going to talk about the about our digital efforts tonight. Creating journalistic value in the digital age is the headline, in which I'm going to talk here. And then, of course, what Berlin's Tagesspiegel can add. Because that's my paper, and that's what I can talk about best. So, but I think that maybe further on in the discussion, but also in the presentation, uh, there will be some things which are uh, general value. I'd like to introduce myself shortly. Um, and the most important bits are the last three months, so that's how you can get in touch with me. Because I always use occasions like this to establish contacts, to <coughs> establish a further discussion. So it's not just me saying that, but Germans say that they really mean it. So if you really get in touch with me, you can get uh, contact, you can ask me further questions if we don't come to certain things we'd like to ask tonight in the discussion. You can contact me on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, so, but I, I think we have a, we put this all on the net, don't we? So, so you're going to get on the later on. All right, so just a few words by way of uh, introduction. Before I became the online editor, so I wasn't always the oldest online editor, I became the online editor six years ago. So you can see six years is already quite old in this business. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of changes there. And before I uh, became the online editor of Tagesspiegel, I worked in the same place. I worked in Tagesspiegel for like 20, more than, uh, about 20 years now. I started out as, a, as an intern there. Um, and later on I became, amongst other things, the metro editor, so the uh, person who's responsible for all the Berlin and, and Brandenburg stuff, for the local stuff. At some stage, the sports editor as well. And that was during the World Cup 2006, so that was a lot of fun. It was a really great job to do that. And for two years, I also had the pleasure to be the London correspondent of the country. And that was really those, that was the time when, that was in 2007, 2008. And that was really the time when I got really hooked up, hooked on um, digital journalism. Because I really found out that uh, British newspapers are much more advanced than we were at that stage. And I think it's the same today. And if you look at the Guardian, particularly the Guardian, it fascinated me then. Um, when I, when I really learned that a lot of the cliches that we have in about, still have, and some, even, even colleagues have those cliches about uh, online journalism has to be short, has to be superficial, it's all bullshit. And, and the Guardian had that already in 2007, 2008. What they did was they, they enabled people to write long text. You can even, you could read them here already, they wrote long text, you know, background. That's what we do online. So it's not about superficiality, it's not about uh, short stuff. It's, it's, in, in my view, it's, it's the opposite, and that's where we, that, I think that's where we're heading as well. Right, um, I'm talking here as a, as a practitioner, um, so I give some input from a practitioner's perspective about our work in a time of crisis, but also in a time of great chances. I'm going to present a couple of clues about how we can use those chances. Those clues come from other practitioners, but also some of them from academia, in an academic environment here, so some of them have to come from academia in a measured kind of way, I should say. Um, after all, I'm a practitioner myself, and not an academic. There are clues I want to present. They're not solutions. No one really has solutions. That's what you learn through your classes uh, for digital journalism. Really, no one has solutions. If somebody claims they have solutions, I, I wouldn't believe it at this, time, uh, at this point in time. Which is why I'm particularly interested in discussion with you later on. Uh, because I'm hoping for more clues that I can also learn from you. So I'm going to start out with a couple of quotes as food for thought, as I would call them. 
and to establish what needs to be done in order to achieve value. Value is the core term we're going to use today. But we need to achieve value from my views and also which I, what I sense the views from those that are running for it. And later on, in the second, more practical part, I don't, I hope you're not going to see that as a kind of advertising part. Of course, I'm going to, of course I'm going to use uh, examples from Target Week, but also some others. But later on, in this more practical part, I would like to show you some, I would say, humble beginnings of how we try in our place, in our staff, to manage change with a couple of ideas that we have in Target Week. Recently, we have some more ideas. So it's a good point in time to, to do a talk like this. Right, every good time, talk in an academic setting starts out with a definition. And I found one that fits my course here very well. It's by George Brock, who's a journalism professor in London. And it goes like this. I would define journalism as the systemic independent attempt to establish the truth of events and issues that matter to society in a timely way. And it's from a book called, well, cleverly called, Out of Print, which of course has a different meanings, Newspaper Journalism and the Business of News in the Digital Age, which I can recommend to you. Um, don't expect any solutions there either, but it's a really good overview. It's a historical overview of change in journalism. It points out that change has always been in a constant in journalism, so it's not something that only happened lately. And it also goes into much detail of, of what, what happens now. So I can really recommend that book to you. And the definition goes a bit further. It has a kind of a sub definition. Verification, this is what we're going to do. This is what we need to do. Verification, sense making, witness, and investigation. Those are the four most important things that Brock define journalism. But it turns out, if we look at those four, they are quite normative. They're not just definitions of something, but they have a, have a normative touch to it. And when we look at it seriously, I think we have to realize that a lot of what we are doing in journalism now has not much to do with this. It has more to do with what we see on the next slide. This is a lot of what we see today in the Google News slide you can see here. And if we look at that, I mean, you all know Tarot, don't you? <laughs> Maybe some of the international people don't. But don't get me wrong, I don't have anything against Tarot, but I, what, what I say now. Though it's always very difficult to uh, explain to English friends what is the great thing about it. This is a kind of a cult in Germany. And, and, and we see here, well, this is really an example for what, what's happening today in journalism, what might not be the right path to follow. Tarek Spiegel is here too. And this is, everybody's doing the same. Everybody's doing the same. Everybody's dealing with the same topic. This can go on and on. This goes like further down and further down. From Osnabrück to Schleswig-Holstein to you name it. Constance or Berlin or competitor among us in the yeah. So if, if we try to measure this by those four points that we had earlier with the defining journalism, a normative definition, verification, that's not much verification in this. Sense making, a little bit more of that, I should say. A good review of the television program. Witness. Well, not really, apart from that the staff gets a, a DVD of the, the program a week earlier or something like that, so there's not much about witness there. And investigation, hardly. There's hardly an investigation there. So this is a good example of what, what's being done in journalism now. Everybody's doing the same, which is not really a change of what I'm going to come to later on should be managed in my opinion. The web racks horizontal integration. This is from a paper by Chris Anderson, Emily Bell, and Clay Shirky. Chris Anderson used to be the editor of Wired. Um, Emily Bell used to be the Guardian, and 
Jay Shirky is a professor at, the, at New York University and a really outspoken critic of journalism. And the, the title of the essay already says a lot about where, where, it, where it heads. Post-industrial journalism adapting to the present. What they call post-industrial journalism already hints at what we might be heading to. And that is that the big ships might sink. I'm not talking about Facebook anymore. I'm talking about big ships from the past. From the, big, from the, big, the industry, what they call industry. Yeah. The huge, huge publishers, huge publishing. And here it goes a bit further. Prior to the web, having a dozen good but not great stories in one bundle, that's a key term, used to be enough to keep someone from hunting for the dozen best stories in a dozen different publications. That's again from Anderson Bellinger. Then, I would have to read the one Tartal story that my regional newspaper, which I, which I subscribe to, would offer. I wouldn't go and buy the Deutsche Zeitung just for that, for that review. So I would have to stick with it. And that sort of held things together. That's how the whole idea worked then. That was why people were, were, were buying the newspaper, because of the bundle. Because it gave you an overview. Part of that might have been a review of the, of the television. But what we have now is what we have seen earlier. And bundling, as we learned, has been wrecked for what they call horizontal integration. So that's not what we have anymore. What we have now is this. In a world of links and feeds, and Google News is nothing else than a feed, but also your Facebook page with the feed or RSS feed or, and all those things. In a world of links and feeds, however, it is often easier to find the next thing you read, watch, or listen to from your friend than it is to stick, than it is to stick with any given publication. So we don't stick with publications. We unbundle. So that's one of our main economic, we're talking about value today. Value in two senses of value for society is very important for me, but also value in an economic sense. Both needs to be addressed. And what comes out of it is, there's no way to support the old one-stop shop model for supplying all or even most of the users' news and information. Because without geographic barriers to entry, there is very little defensible advantage in running commodity news. That's the same as in the next town or state over and over again. And this is what I had earlier. I think this tart or feed, really, that's commodity news. That's really everybody doing the same stuff. And we have to ask ourselves if we really do that. And that's where economy comes, business comes into the picture. This is a quote from a guy called Nicholas Klaassen who wrote a book. But well, he's not a he's not a from academic environment. I think he's an entrepreneur himself. And he wrote a book called The Digital Tsunami. That's the title. I don't think it's translated to English so far, so it's my translation here. Um, the title addressed already what it's about. It's about change that might overrun us. That's also a scenario that could happen. Because publishers have high expenses to, to create content, but then get revenue only through clicks. So it's all click based, most of it. Good content, though, can only be produced through a double digit cost per thousand impressions. Thousand impressions is always how discounted. I get three euro by thousand impressions. That's also, this is really realistic. Three euros by, by thousand impressions for, for example, for an online gallery or something like that. This is what, what advertisers pay them. So this is nothing. You cannot achieve that to create high, high quality content <coughs> just by marketing clicks, but rather through brand advertising. And brand advertising is where we are back in a classic environment where we really sell image and quality and not clicks, which is just quantity which is what we do today, which is really part of the problem. Here it becomes even a bit more philosophical. I like this quote a lot because it's by a guy, Chartbeat, that's a company who measures, a company which measures clicks. Not just clicks, they try to develop further and they measure other things as well, which we come to later on. And this guy, who lives by measuring clicks, says the click flooded the web with spam, link bait, painful design and tricks that treated users like lab rats. So this is really outspoken. 
And this is really how we are treated in some places on the net. And I have to admit, we are also treated like that attack in some So it's, it's really, that's, that's where we are at the moment. That's where we have to get away. Evan Williams, Twitter founder, and lately involved with Medium, which is a blogging page. Um, blog, systematic blogging page, where you can put your own blog out. And it's, a, it's a bit like a social media. A culture whose measure of success is not something that brings value to other people, is likely to drive self-serving and manipulative behavior. Self-serving is something that is very evident. I don't think anybody really looks who's that audience that is clicking on your page. For example, it's, it's a very cool example. If you, if you put a, a piece on which, you, which deals with migration, you would have a very high click rate for this piece. But where would it come from? <coughs> it would come from really disgusting right populist sites like Pop Verlag and other like PE News and, and other, which give you a high range for these pieces, but they are not at all quality, quality audience. It's not an audience in the market, it's not an audience you want for your, for your publicist values, it's, it's not an audience you, you want at all, but it counts as much as any other audience. So that's an example where it shows that we are really in a just quantitative environment. We need to get into a qualitative, qualitative environment. There's hope. There's hope. Earlier on I said there's no one who has solutions, but there's one guy who always has solutions in German. That's Thomas Knieber. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Thomas Knieber is a very outspoken media critic. He used to be a colleague at, at Handelsblatt. Um, now he really makes his sort of profile by criticizing journalists, which is very good, because we need that. We criticize people all the time, so we also need some people like him or, or Stefan Niggemeier, or others who, who criticize us. And he has spotted something, found something which I found very interesting, so I used this tweet here. It's in half in German, so I have to translate it. Um, you read about the future of publishers on the internet here. And what does he post there? He quotes Ed Williams, the guy who we had earlier. He's the Twitter founder and the founder of Medium. And he has this really great statement, which is also forms the headline here. Medium has never done an ad deal based on impressions. So that's a great statement. That's not, not, not something we could say. Impressions are keeps. Okay. Impressions is page impressions, that's the main, still, still the main measure how advertising is, advertising is uh, done on the net. And that is how revenue comes in. The main revenue at the moment comes in on the net. Attention is an increasingly popular word among publishers and advertisers. It's a finite resource. Perhaps the only final resource <coughs> with the digital infinity where content is churned out constantly. To capture and hold someone's attention is becoming simultaneously more important and more difficult than ever. Yet, most digital advertising campaigns are bought and sold on impressions. So even in the States, it's not that we are back here in Germany or anything, which we are at many digital things, but here we have a statement from the States. The number of people who screens load a page with the ad, regardless of time spent on the ad, or if people even notice it, or I may want to add which people actually are on the other end of the receiver. There have been rumblings about charging advertisers based on the amount of time spent viewing an ad online. A few publishers, most notably the Financial Times, have tested it, but the practice is far from widespread. So there's not much effort put into this. That would be a first step to say attention a new measure. The time I spend on a page, not clicking around, debating, uh, and all that. So that would be a step towards quality. But since all, all the publishers and, and, and journalists are in a kind of hamster wheel that there is a crisis and then there's lack of money, lack of funds, they don't really dare to change things like that. Because the, the model that they have at the moment, if, if it works, well, there's, there's still some, some, there's more revenue, there's a bit more revenue, but they sense that the revenue will not be enough to run a, an industrial, uh, what used to be a, an old Google publishing house, but still we go on and on and on like this. So what we need is a, is a turn. And then even more hope. This is what Ben Thompson says. He's a guy who runs a blog called Stratechery, and he claims, and that is why, why I 
shows that here. He insists that he can support himself fully for what he's doing with his blog. And that is what more and more people achieve. And this is not by paid content. This is by advertising. And this is by a certain kind of advertising which is more into quality than quantity. Well, it's a tech blog, so it's a bit easier than what we are doing. We are not doing tech uh, journalism. We are doing sort of yeah, commodity, or what we said earlier. Um, so what we need is, might want to need, and I come to that later on, might need more specialization, like guys, uh, like, like Ben Thompson. The thing about internet scale is what he says, it doesn't just have to mean you strive to serve the most possible people at the lowest possible price. Individuals and focused publications or companies can go the other way and charge relatively high prices, but with far better products or services than were previously possible. And he doesn't mean pay content. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about advertising. And he, he, he gives a, Brother Ronnie gives a good example from, from sort of analog history. And he claims that, as an example, that Mercedes Benz, who only found it after Ford had already reached their lowest price possible with their T model. So that was the moment when Mercedes Benz came to so We have something that gives hope. You know, what we need is this, sort of Mercedes Benz of online journalism. Um, in order to, to get higher, higher revenue and then invest and then develop online journalism. So what would be the consequence of all this? Of realizing that there is no future in commodity content, other bits, you know, in clickbaiting content because of advertising by clicks. In order to create value for our readers as well as for our advertising customers, we have to ask ourselves one all important question. And that is, what can we add? How can we get out of this out of this rat race for clicks? How can we use our resources not for more of the same? Not for writing the hundred and umpteen or whatever review. That's only an example. There's a lot of uh, football. Why does everybody have to write about every single Bundesliga match, every single newspaper? A football fan. I like it. You, you have to ask that question. Why, why is that? Why do we put resources in that? So, more of the same what everybody does. That's not where we are. What we need to create is unique content with a higher value, which could then be marketed by way of quality and not just quality. And maybe at some stage, you have sense by now that I don't really believe in paid content at the stage that we are in at the moment for general journalism we are doing. But maybe at some stage when we develop that further, you need content. At some stage there may be a chance for it also for paid content. And this, this question, what can we add, is directly linked to who can we add value for? So our target group. Or maybe target group. I don't think we can go on like this that we sort of serve everybody. We do it at the moment. Collect clicks from whoever just passes by. Well, we did some research at Tanki. We had a, we might have realized that, what that only means that we had a new um, publisher, uh, Sebastian Turner, who's from, from advertising. His background is in advertising. But he brought some, some really new and Good ideas, good ideas also into not only into the marketing aspect but also into the, into the journalistic aspect. There's a lot of criticism too. We can all address that later on. There's no problem at all. But lobbying and all these things and advertising and, and, um, and, and, and editing which has to be separated. And he's also, he's also a guy who says it has to be separated. Um, but there, there have been quite some ideas, particularly with target groups. And, and, and advertisers are very good at defining target groups. That's something where, where journalists can learn from. And we, we are learning this. So what we did, we did some research and found out something that we weren't aware of, actually. Though so in retrospect, it sounds pretty obvious, but we weren't aware of it. And that was more than half of the political decision makers in the capital of Berlin used time. So all PR people came up with this cheeky little chart here. That we can see here. Well, this is a PR chart. I have to say that it's a PR chart. I don't want to do PR here. I don't want to do advertising with you. For me, the most and for me, it's also not very important that we say you know we have more people than more readers than uh, Hamid, Fats, Welt, and whatever. Uh, all in all, 
for me, the most important thing is really to say that more than half of the political decision makers in Berlin, which is political decision makers, means very widespread, 30,000 people, 30, 40,000 people. So that's a market. It's not just a few people who are in the Bundestag or anything, but it's a huge market. And we found that out, and that was, that was quite interesting for us. So we tried to come up with ideas how we can actually serve those people. Serve those people? And I don't mean serve as in uncritically writing about them, because that's not what they want. That's not what they want. And serve those people without endangering losing other people. And politics, I think, is a very good topic where you can do that. Where you can say, I have a target group, but I think the other people would also like what we're doing. What I'm going to show you now. So what we did was a new section online and the news. Now it likes the likes the printed papers. <laughs> Exit out now. Because maybe because it's, it's smaller. So we, we did that online. It was called Agenda. Agenda. And it's like a four, three, five page inlet that we have every week. And we try to develop it further because it's, it's quite a success with advertising and with readers. And we try to develop further that we might have it daily at some stage. So we have this definition of a target group and try to tailor something for the target group, hoping, thinking that others would also like it. So it's a kind of journal for politics in the capital. It explains politics. That's what it tries to do. It tries to create transparency. It records work in Parliament and in the political Berlin. So a bit of name dropping helps as well there. If people find their names in there, it helps. But also, it's a, it's a record of their work. So it's also, there's always a critical perspective to it. And I think this comes very close to those four things that we had earlier. That was verification, sense-making, witness, and investigation. Why can we do this here? Because it's just on our doorstep. We don't need to travel here. We don't have travel expenses or anything. We don't need huge technology or anything. We just walk there. We can research there. We can pick up the telephone, which is very important still for journalism. It's not only the net that we research in. And this is really on our doorstep. It's, it's a great a great gift for us that, that we are that we are in the capital with our whole staff. Others have to send staff here. We are here with our whole staff. So why not make more of it? That was one of the products. As a journalist, I don't really like the word product, but if you don't have a, a better one. Content is also not a very nice word. Another thing is the newsletter that we started then. And here, here we have it's 35,000. 35,000 people get this every morning. It's a kind of a morning briefing that you can get <coughs> on your smartphone. It's called Morgenlage, which is uh, like what Chancellor Merkel said every morning. It's a Morgenlage. And it's not just any other newsletter. The idea behind it is really to, to give people uh, in five minutes, ten minutes, reading an overview of the entire political aspects of the day. What's really coming important in politics. There's also an economic the economics version of it, um, and it's not like other newsletters. It, it's not an advertising instrument. It's not links to target speaking. Target speaking links are in there. Some of them I can show this here, um, but there are also links to all the other other papers. It's a bit. It's modeled a bit on. I don't know if, if, if you've seen that by Peter Turi, who's, who's a media uh, branch guy who uh, had the idea of coming up with such a newsletter. And we adopted it. I have to say. For the politics market. And that was also there was a startup that did this, which was called Political Post, which came from Berlin, half Berlin and half LA, because most of the stuff is uh, collected overnight, done in LA, so that's, that's ready in the morning. Uh, and that was the first acquisition uh, we, we did when the controller came to get the Tagespiegel. And so it was branded with Tagespiegel, it was developed and refined a bit, and it, it really works. It's, it's something that, that people seem to seem to have waited for, uh, as opposed to all the other newsletters, which we yeah, newsletters, dozens and hundreds of newsletters on our page, which were never really a success, but this one is. But we shouldn't get too carried away. Um, and we aren't as arrogant to think that those decision makers that I mentioned earlier, read us only for our sublime 
proteins from that. And this shows it's a very secret figures here, so don't tell anyone. Um, but it learned a very dangerous look of it. But this is just cut out from, uh, from our weekly uh, reportings that we have, which are, of course, by page impressions. But still, that's the measure, um, that's the measure we, we have. Um, so it's weekly page impressions of on target people DE that shows, well, politics is beaten by a wide margin by all the Berlin content. So this is the, this is the most recent week, these are the two weeks before that. And that's a constant here. We have sometimes politics is very strong, depends on the, on, the, on the content, but Berlin is always very strong. So we could say that those decision makers read Tagesspiegel possibly for politics content. Of course, they read it because they live in Berlin, so they won't be from the local system. And that's mainly what, in my view, not only because I come from that background and I always liked the local, local journalism. But in my view, this is a very important aspect. Not to subscribe to the Deutsche Zeitung, very good paper, very, very good paper, but to Tagesspiegel, because you live in Berlin. And to go to Tagesspiegel uh, online, because you live in Berlin and you need, need that stuff there. So, what we have here is, is a great advantage, and that advantage is Berlin. And there's another interesting thing there. On, on Tagesspiegel online, we, we are read like 80% from, from, from the national audience. So, and still, the Berlin stuff is the, the most widely read. So there's a clue there that obviously Berlin stuff is read nationally, which I wouldn't think anybody would claim from Munich or Hamburg stuff. But what happens in Berlin, like the latest stuff on the DR airport or whatever, or if there's a car, is uh, lit up in Kreuzberg or things like that, people in Stuttgart are interested. It doesn't happen the stuff that happens in Munich. Very rarely it happens, but it happens very rarely. So this is things you need to do for your for your paper to, to find out what was the special thing, what, what what you can add. What, what I said earlier. So we try to not only to start some new offers for our readers in the political sector, but also in the Berlin sector. This is what came out of it. So if anybody of you has, has read it, I can recommend it, of course. It's by my friend and uh, for, for Editor in chief, Lorenz Marat. And he does a very, very personal newsletter every, like, every night, really, every night. Um, there's, there's some stuff, you know, there's exclusive stuff in there that you can read. There's, he's around for, for 25 years in Berlin, he knows the city, so he can really compile this. And it's the same uh, principle than the other thing earlier on. It's, it's not just advertising targeting links, there's links to the, the competitors, there's, there's no link at some stage. Uh, so this is not, not an advertising effort, it's a journalistic, it's really a journalistic effort. Fitting the four points in the definition of the world. So it's, it's a mixture every day of, of political news and of comment, very sort of hard-hitting comment now and then. People are hurt at some stage, but it happens all the time now, in the few weeks that we are doing this now. And service, which is very important too. Another thing that we just started this week, um, last week, rather, and that's a, our light picker, which is sort of dealing with Berlin news in the morning. This is not a complete, it's not a new idea. Everybody's doing light tickers those, these days. Berliner Zeitung has one in the morning as well, our competitor, but they didn't dare, for some reason, didn't dare to make this step uh, really focusing on Berlin. They're doing something which is sort of again more, more, more of the same. Uh, combining everything news from all over the world. And we really, really focus on Berlin. That's also not new. Bit set, the uh, Yellow Press paper um, does the same. They do it 24 hours by now. So journalistic jobs are approaching uh, 24 hours availability. But they're doing mostly crime and uh, traffic stuff. So we try to do, as you can see here, we try to be more political there. So that, that was another idea. And maybe finally, what we also started, not only to be local, but we tried to be hyper-local. That's one of the really hype words of the moment. Um, hyper-local meaning in a city like Berlin. If you're hyper-local in Berlin, then you're local in, in Saarbrücken, whatever, you know, because a uh, place like Neukölln or, uh, or Zehlendorf is as big as, uh, as places like Kiel or, or Saarbrücken or, or Wiesbaden. So it's 
hyperlocal is, well, it's not really true here. So we try something more hyperlocal, which I think I will say later on. So we started with those blocks. We call them blocks in the beginning. We're not very really happy with this, which is good for other words. Um, and adding value to local reporting, bringing back what our newspaper had to abandon, because we used to have this in the printed newspaper. And not as much as we can do online now, but we had pages for this in the printed paper. We had 12, 14, 16 Berlin pages. Now we have four and six. So all this doesn't happen in the printed paper anymore, but it happens here. It's difficult to market because, of course, these things don't have a wide range. So they don't have clicks, clicks, clicks. So we have to find out ways to market them in a different way, in a qualitative way. And this is only starting now. So we have Zehendorf or Kreuzberg or Pankow that's where we started. We try to uh, open one after the other. We also started with an even more local thing. Hyper can be, I don't know, there's more than Hyper. Difficult, but we started one only for photos and not for that kids. <laughs> it's only for that kids. Of course, with the, with the view behind it that things that happen at Kutlis and not, which is more people than again, and of course, there is a, might, might be a lot of advertising you can get out of that, but it's also very interesting. The city west is, is now developing, and everybody's saying it's, it's even more, more interesting in some stages than Mitte. Sorry. Than Mitte. <laughs> um, so that's, those are the, the, the ideas that you have to bring about. But this is all not completely new with us. We have a very interesting benchmark here. Uh, and that's Tegan sehr stimmen. Don't laugh. It's really advertising everything. But this thing works. It works. I know the guy very well who does it. Um, they can really, they can support three full-time journalists. Right? And it's an online-only thing. And they started there and they found out that Michel Merkur, who was there, it was very lackluster there. They didn't really invest in anything. So, so these guys just went there and opened that blog, which was a blog in the beginning. And now it's a, it's a full-fledged online, online newspaper, which, which is expanding all the time. And a bit closer to home, I know this one. That was the first one, sort of more ambitious project we had in Berlin. They celebrated everywhere. Which articles in their spiegel when they start the And what both of them have in common, um, what Digger Wirschwinger or they or our blogs have in common, well, we hope it with our blogs, they have it already. No one ever, no advertiser ever asked those guys how many clicks they have. No one ever asked them. Because it's, it's a community thing. People want to be in there with other people. Like that's why advertisers want to be there. So people are talking about it. And that's why it works. And so Bergnachricht is much more difficult, of course, than Tegernsee. Sorry. And Tegernsee, uh, which, we, which, we, which we saw earlier. Well, I could have stopped here, but I wanted to show you a bit nostalgically. Because since that was crossed out in the beginning, I have even more reason now to show it to you. That there is some things that print can still add. And that is really print, yeah, that's what you see here. I don't know if you know our, our section here that we're doing now. And this is something that you can really you can put it on your wall, and you can never do this online. Um, which is each A1 or A0 prints. Uh, also with arts, uh, the, the collaboration with artists in Berlin. So that's, I think, one way that it's, it's a bit like vinyl in the to CDs or MP3s, um, it becomes a luxury product. I think that would work still. Not only with Berlin stuff, we also do that with sports stuff. Elf Freunde täglich. Um, we started this cooperation with Elf Freunde, the football magazine, in um, 2006, um, in the World Cup. And it, it runs ever since. We do it with huge tournaments. And uh, we, we do it once a week. And, we'll figure out. and this is not the anti Bundesliga uh, review of, of a game between Hoffenheim and Liverpool. You can see it's, it's completely different. It's sort of, it has an, an, an arts perspective. And that's what we try to develop. Well, I think this is 